Good morning. I'm Jerry Campbell, and I will be giving the adult Sunday school lesson for First Baptist Church, Statesville, North Carolina. We're glad you've tuned in. We hope that you will become a regular visitor to our Sunday school lessons each Sunday morning. This morning, we'll be studying the, the, about the 10th or 11th lesson that we have been studying of prayers. Prayers that Jesus uttered, as well as uh, a few prayers from the Old Testament that people like Nehemiah himself uh, is recorded in the, in the book of Nehemiah. All of these prayers we have been studying have had different content. They were prayed for different reasons and they were written so that we may learn more about how to pray and when to pray and what kind of things that we should uh, include in our prayers. Today, we're going to be looking at a lesson from Luke. This, this same prayer is also recorded in the book of Matthew, a much longer version. And it's the one that in Matthew that we normally use in our corporate prayers in our churches and even in our private worship. You all know it. It's the one that Jesus gave when one of the disciples said to him, would you teach us how to pray? And so Jesus gave us a sample prayer, a, a prayer that covers all the bases, a prayer that is easy to remember. And it's a prayer that we can use to contact and talk with God. We all know it. Sometimes we even sing it. I tried singing and I thought, well, I might sing that for you, but then I decided, no, not, not that. You see, while I love to sing the Lord's Prayer, when it gets down toward those last notes, I have trouble reaching. And so I wind up screeching rather than singing. So I will not attempt to sing that prayer for you today. But I hope you will sing it after this lesson is over this morning. Singing loudly and lustily and with a lot of fervor. Luke's version, as I said, is noticeably shorter than the more famous version as told by Matthew. The version is Matthew is more detailed and was used for a gathering of believers. Corporate prayer. The shorter version as recorded by Luke is more fit for a regular individual to pray, to use rather than a corporate prayer by many, is somewhat shorter. From the book of Luke, we read, now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, that one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day by day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the 
evil one. You recognize when you look at this and, and when you uh, read this, these few verses that these words are slightly different from Matthew's version. They're only slightly different from those that we pray in our churches in the morning. Different churches use different versions of this as it has been translated over the years from the original language that it was written in. We use different words such as debtors or transgressions. Those kinds of words are, are we sometimes say for the forgive those who had, uh, we have debts with them and so forth. And we talk about trespasses. They're all the same words used as synonyms. And so according to which church we go to and which, uh, which version we use, learned as a child, that's the one we pray. Now in this, these verses we learn that Jesus gave this prayer in answer to one of the disciples who asked Jesus how to pray. This seems at first reading that the disciples did not know how to pray. How could they not? After all, they were Jews. As Jews, they would have attended the synagogues and the temple occasionally where prayers were read or prayed several times each day. In fact, most male Jews were required and expected to bow down or stand with raised hands a minimum of three times a day. And those times were prescribed specifically to whatever you were doing to stop and pray facing toward where the temple was located. Also, the prayers that were prayed were generally prescribed. The adult Jewish males knew which prayer to pray in the morning and which prayer to pray at lunchtime and which time to pray in the evening. The prayers were prescribed. And so these disciples would have prayed. The prayers that they would have said would have been prayers that were written hundreds of years before and were repeated over and over in all the synagogues and in the temple itself. If there were any special request or any things that dealt specifically with the person praying, they were added on at the end of the prescribed prayers. And so the disciples knew how to pray, but they had heard Jesus pray, and Jesus' prayers were different. He prayed about different things, and he didn't just use the prescribed prayers but he used his own prayers. And he prayed for things that normally would not get prayed for by the average Jewish male. You see, Jesus prayed for people in need. And Jesus prayed for those people who were suffering. And he prayed for those people who were not even recognized as persons in the Jewish culture. So Jesus' prayers were different and they had heard him praying many times. Now as a child brought up in the synagogue, Jesus would have learned to pray all those prayers that they, the disciples knew how to pray. But the prayers he prayed were not strictly the prescribed prayers 
for prayers that came out of his need and his his uh, love and care for the people around him. You see, Jesus was a people person, and he came to minister to the people and bring them back to God. So he didn't need the, just the prescribed prayers. He prayed specific prayers. Now, we don't know the context of all of those specific prayers, but we have some as were written and copied by writers such as Luke and, and Matthew and Mark and John, even Paul wrote some about Jesus' specific prayers. When Jesus went out in the wilderness, he was alone. Only he and God were privileged to hear those prayers. And when he had time to move around to the, from the crowds that gathered around and he went off by himself occasionally, he prayed prayers that were specific specifically to the needs of those people that he cared for. Now, we don't know all the times that he prayed with and for the disciples, but we know he prayed for the disciples many times because they were humans. They were men who, like us, were not perfect. And they were not always paying attention. And they didn't always listen. And they didn't always learn from the prayers that Jesus prayed. But he prayed often. And they wanted to learn how to pray like Jesus. This prayer that he gave them this sample prayer, and the sample is my words, not the scripture's words. But this sample prayer that he gave them covered many different bases. We're not sure if this is the same prayer that Jesus prayed with his disciples or if he gave it to them specifically because they asked for one. But we do know it came, became a model for the Christian church. The prayer that's most prayed most often, and it's not a prescribed prayer, it's one that comes from the heart. Now we include it in our Sunday bulletin and in our Sunday worship simply because it is a time of prayer. And we have a time of prayer in each of our Sunday school and church gatherings. And since it covers most of the basis that should be included in a prayer, and because it is the prayer that Jesus gave the disciples and therefore gave to us, we pray it often in our churches. While Luke and Matthew's versions are different, the core of the prayer is the same. And even though today, in our different translations of the Bible, the words are slightly different. The core values and the core experience of this prayer is the same. We pray it for the same reason. And we cover the basis with God that comes through praying this prayer. Our verses said, so he said to them, when you pray, say, 
God, uh, Jesus didn't give them a prescribed time to pray. He didn't say, pray this, this every morning and you'll be okay. Or pray it before you go to bed at night. What he did say was, when you pray. He left the time and whether it was in a public or private space, he didn't specify. He simply said, when you pray. And by saying when you pray, it also means that you are to pray. And so in Jesus teaching the disciples how to play, to pray, he also teaches us how to pray. And he gave this an example that we can use when we want to connect with God. And it goes like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And on earth as it is in heaven, these verses begin with a statement of the relationship of man and God. God is in heaven. He's not, he's not here with us. He's establishing a relationship that God is, as we believe today, and we have been taught that he is with us, but he is also in heaven. And his name is something special. Now, here he did not call him Yahweh, or he did not use any of the other names for God. He said, our Father meaning that we are to have a close relationship, but he is also removed from us. He is not us, but he is our father. And his name is to be hallowed, to be respected, to be loved. His name is to be above us. And then it says, your kingdom come, your will be done, as it is in heaven. It tells of the faith and the hope that his will is to be done, regardless of how we fit into that. And we know that while we have the faith and the hope that we will be part of his kingdom someday, we know that that depends on him also. And we can only hope and we have faith and we can only live in a way that he would have us live so that someday when his will is finished and is done, for us, that we will be with him in his kingdom. These show these words, I will be done, show the hope and expectancy of our beings that we will be part of that plan. He says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. When he says, give us our daily bread, he's not talking about bread. We know that everything we have, all of the blessings that we have, we receive from God. And all of those things that we need in order to survive comes from him. And all of the needs that we have are met by God. 
And so when he's talking about our daily bread, he's talking about our physical, our mental, and our emotional needs. All our, our food, our, our ability to keep warm and, and to uh, live and be sheltered in our lives. All this comes from God. And that's what bread stands for in this. Jesus used this expression, bread, many times in his teaching and in his talking with the disciples. And they understood the meaning of bread, that it means more than just that meat, the bread that they ate with their everyday meals. This is also acknowledged that only God can provide for us. And it's used to signify or cover all the basic needs that we have. He next turns to the acknowledging of our faults, our transgressions, and our sins. It also acknowledges that God has promised to forgive our sins and that he has the power to do so. We simply need to acknowledge and ask. Now, whether we use the word debtors or whether we use the word uh, uh, the other words that he uses, we know what we need to ask forgiveness for. And so we ask God to forgive us for our trespasses or whatever. And we believe that God does hear our prayer and that he does forgive us when we acknowledge our sins and come before him in repentance. He speaks not only of our forgiveness, but he also asks, has some other words. For we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Forgiveness of others, not only those who are owe us money or owe us favors, but to all people, all of those people who come across our path and those people who we hold uh, prejudices against them simply because they're dirty, they're unkempt, they're sinners, they're not people like us. You see, the Pharisees, they look down upon these kind of people. But Jesus said, forgive them. Forgive them. Acknowledge them and, and treat them as we would like to be treat, treated. In other places, he adds another, uh, another uh, commandment, and that is to love everybody as ourselves. And so this forgiveness that he's talking about, it's not only to just people who owe us money, but people that we have a grudge against. Or that we have a problem with. Those people who come into our lives and we wish they hadn't. We are to forgive them as God forgives us. He then encloses this entreaty to not lead us into temptation. God does not lead us into temptation, but he does allow temptation to be a part of our lives and interaction with each other. This is an entreaty 
for God to make us strong enough and have the power to resist the temptations that come our way. And we ask God, we're asking God not to let those temptations come our way. And we don't know how many temptation God sabotages along their way to us. To us. We don't know how many times God extends his grace to us so that we don't get in trouble. And we don't have temptations that lead to problems in our lives. He tells us to pray that we do not have temptations in our lives. And when we do, we have the ability to turn away from them or at least to live with them and acknowledge the problems that come from them and then pray to God that he would relieve us from our sins that come from these temptations. The last phrase asks that God delivers us from the evil one. Who is the evil one? Well, according to how you were raised, it has different names. When I was a child, we had the booger man. We were scared of the booger man because the booger man would get us. Later, we learned that the name that most churches use is Satan. And we have read and learned about the Satan and how Satan comes into the lives of people. We have also heard him called the evil one. Or the ruler of the underworld, as the Greeks and the Romans thought of him. We pray in, in God. We pray that God will deliver us from this personage, however he is called. Now, today we don't speak as much about the devil and Satan and the specific creatures that are in our world that come to destroy us and to lead us astray. But we know he's there. And we know there is that spirit of the Satan that does come into our lives occasionally. And we see this uh, portrayed pers personage portrayed in the lives of others, the people who beat their children, the people who beat their wives and treat them badly those people who get drunk and go on rampages, those people who take guns and go out and shoot innocent people. We see the work of Satan in many places. When we, we come across people, sometimes we think of them as being a dealing with Satan because they're so mean or they're so ugly to the people around us and the way they live and the way they act. We think they have Satan instead of God in their lives. Sometimes Temptation comes to us and we yield to temptation. And so this person deliberately leads us astray. And sometimes things like drugs, alcohol, 
or just plain meanness become a pattern that we would fall into and begin practicing as, as humans. And we sometimes fail to recognize that we have this evil in our lives. But in this prayer, he said, deliver us from evil. And so every time we pray this prayer, we ask God to deliver us from evil. Now, Jesus provided a model prayer for his disciples. For the most part, we've adopted it right out of one version of the Bible or the other. It has become our main prayer, our main way of speaking to God, to our Father. And it signifies that we want to become closer to him by calling him our Father, and that we recognize him as being all-powerful and always there for us, a part of our family. It is just as perfect a prayer today as it was for the disciples in Jesus' time, and as he gave it to them, and he said, when you pray, use this prayer. How, when, where, and what we pray about becomes a personal part of our prayers. Jesus gave us this prayer and simply said, when you pray, this is a prayer that you may wish to pray. Well, I hope that we all do wish to pray this prayer and that we pray it often. And so I'm going to ask as we close this lesson that you bow your heads and you either sing this lesson lustily, this, this, this prayer, or you pray it with me. Now I'm going to pray the prayer as we normally pray it in our church. And if you come to the words and they're different, you just pray your way. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning, and we hope you'll join us again next Sunday in, or whenever you can find us online.